Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews, the show where we bring you up close and personal with some of Canada's most exciting and vibrant communities. I'm Christopher Brown, your host for this exciting journey. This episode of the Cross Border Interviews was recorded live at the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan in April. Our show is dedicated to sitting down with local elected leaders from communities all across Canada, and our goal is to learn about who they are, what drives them, and how they are working to make their communities a better place for everyone who lives there. Today's guest is LaRange Councillor Jordan McPhail. Um, Jordan, I want to start with the overarching question that I've asked a lot of municipal politicians, especially Mike, and you're no exception. Where'd your sense of duty to serve come from? Uh, I often say that I didn't ever see myself as a leader, um, and I think that anyone that uh, gets involved in politics needs to do it with a community approach first. And for me, uh, getting involved in the municipal sector, kind of what happened was I, uh, I was going around door to door for uh, federal and provincial uh, politicians in, in my area and talking to people about the issues that they were facing on their day to day. And when the municipal op, uh, election uh, um, and its opportunities uh, to serve as a councillor opened up, uh, I actually had community members come up to me and ask if I would be willing to sit in those situations or sit, sit as a councillor. And uh, at first, I was taken aback. I always saw myself as a person that was behind the scenes, not in front of them. And uh, you know, after hearing the, some, some of the overwhelming support that I had from the community, ultimately decided to put my name forward for that uh, municipal election and I've sat there for about seven, eight years coming um, and enjoyed it every minute of it. So I want to go back to when you were canvassing as a staffer or a campaign worker compared to being a councillor. When you were talking to people in your community, were there more macro issues or were there more micro issues that you were dealing with? And when you campaigned for yourself in that subsequent election, what were they? More macro issues or more micro issues that you were approaching? So the, the issues that we had faced um, in, in the north are, are quite unique. Um, I, I would say as, as an elected official um, municipally, I'll, I'll kind of answer that in reverse. Yep. Um, so in, in my election, uh, where I was the person on the ballot, um, the, the dynamic was a little different because when people brought the issues, and a lot of the issues um, from the general voter, they don't really know the difference between what the jurisdiction would be between a municipal politician, a provincial politician, or a federal politician. Their issue is the same, and they want everyone to know that their their issue. So, you know, um, going into the municipal election, me being the, the candidate on the ballot, I had to be the one to answer the questions. Yeah. These were the policy questions and advocacy places that they wanted to know from me, not the not the political party or the candidate that I was on the doorstep representing for that party. So it, it, it was definitely um, a, a little bit more of a personal touch. And I think the issues, you know, surrounding the North um, and especially in LaRange and areas um, from the positions that I've held uh, are, are fairly unique. We have a lot of uh, mental health addictions, uh, homelessness, housing, um, and, and housing hard to house individuals are, are you know, common themes that we see throughout Northern Saskatchewan. And the ability to participate in the economy is also very different. A lot of our communities are fly in and fly out uh, in Northern Saskatchewan. And, you know, LaRange is kind of one of those, we call ourselves the capital of Northern Saskatchewan. It's kind of an area where, um, a lot of communities come to to get close. It's uh, the hub. It's the hub of of the north, in in especially on the east side. Yeah. Uh, the west side has a very cool uh, collaborative approach to how they participate in the economy. A lot of um, uh, regional uh, development corporations and whatnot. Very very cool. Um, and in the so so to I guess to answer your question in short, uh, the the issues that were that we were brought to to our campaign both um, when I was working on the provincial and on the municipal um, are, are the same issues, but the approach on what your role in facing those issues had changed. So the, the issues are the same, the approach is different. I love that, I love that statement. I wanna go dig a little bit deeper into that if you don't mind. Municipal governments get downloaded a lot. You have to deal with if there's a doctor shortage, even though it's a provincial issue. There's an education issue. You're the front lines, and people are going to be talking to you. You talk about the uh, unknown from residents of what's a municipal issue, what's a provincial issue, what's a federal issue. How do you deal with that? Because as an elected official, you know the different levels of government and who deals with what, but your residents doesn't don't care, and you're right. They want you to fix it. How do you do that? 
I wanted to correct one statement. The, the, the residents don't care um, on, on which level of government. No, they don't uh, care. They don't care about who, who has to fix it. They've approached you right. to fix it. And, they and want you, because you're their elected official, yeah. to take their issue and then run with it and try to address it for them. Yeah, and, and, and I was only challenging the part on, on the residents don't care because what typically what I've done is in the in the scenarios where I've talked to them about who owns it, then they then they know where to direct that fire yep. for, for the, the issue, let's say, on, on the teachers, right? They know that they can talk to me about the teachers, and when I come to places like SUMA conventions and whatnot, I can go and, uh, and uh, ask questions of ministers on when they, when they plan and amplify those, those local voices. Um, but then when it comes down to what can I do municipally, I can say that, you know, I'll stand up and in, in our council chambers and advocate for um, creating zoning bylaws that are more suitable for um, MDUs or small families or, or new professionals in our area that, that would be directly related to how a municipality can help solve the issue of recruiting teachers. And, and you know, in our area, La Ronge specifically, um, housing, for not just those that are hard to house, but those that are professionals and moving to our community, one of the biggest retention issues that we have is that we don't have you know, um, accessible daycare spaces, we don't have um, accessible housing, and because, that we, because we have so many professionals looking for housing, what we're actually seeing is a bit of a squeeze on, on the people with the lowest socioeconomic classes in our community because um, you know, the, the higher end houses are still going to the people with the higher end paying jobs. The middle income is now being overloaded by professionals that could probably afford higher end housing but are looking at what is only available in the inventory in our community. So looking at uh, our, our land use and how we create new subdivisions that would allow developers to build those houses, those are municipal issues and I work alongside the people that are bringing the issues to me. And every time that someone's reached out to me, I look at it as an opportunity to educate them on what I know rather than just saying, hey, I see your issue and I'm gonna deal with it. There's the odd resident that says, no, I've done my job, I've told you, and I don't care about the process. Um, you are aware, <laughs> and now if you wanna be reelected in four years, I need you to come up with a plan. <laughs> there, there is that contingent, but I always believe but it's, it's small my- minority. It is, yeah. and, and I believe that part of my duty and obligation as an elected official is to also help educate people that might wanna take my seat one day, or if they have aspirations to get involved in their community on a deeper level, to help educate them so that if they ever do, that they can hit the ground running and know where to best put that fire in their bellies and where to direct, direct that, uh, that passion. One of the reasons why I'm here today in, with Atsuma is to learn about apathy in municipal levels, particularly in Saskatchewan. We are seeing a voter decline we are seeing more and more people caring about provincial politics or federal politics because it's partisan and there's the conflict. Municipally, as councillors, you work together as a whole to ensure the betterment of your community. In your community of Larange, do you see an apathetic nature when it comes to municipal issues? And when you're engaging people, how do you engage the, the vocal, the non-vocal majority? the ones who aren't on social media, the ones aren't in your echo chamber. And do you do that? Uh, for me, the, the best way for, for voter <laughs> engagement has always been two feet in a heartbeat. Uh, <laughs> I love that saying. I, 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 I know in, in both 2016, 2020, 14,000, 20,000, 40,000 steps over the course of a month, yep. uh, and, and even sometimes in a day, uh, depending on whether you're going into apartment complexes, trailer courts, higher higher end housing areas or, or talking to business owners um, and you know I, I think part of the uh, apathy that you might be looking at is just the is you know we, we've been in education sessions here and I believe that there's this belief that it doesn't matter who you have in power that they're going to do the same thing anyway yeah. um, and well I think the one of the first sessions was the trust in politicians is so low right now yeah that they, like you said, they expect you to do the exact same thing that they just voted the other person out for. Yeah, and, and that's, for, for me, that's where the, the, the change in process of, of what municipal politicians or provincial or federal politicians can do. I know for myself as a, as a municipal politician, um, when we've brought issues forward to um, like ministries of social services to talk about homelessness in, in the north, um, I know that a lot of times we, we will typically have to go maybe two or three meetings before we actually get a minister. We can't talk politician to politician. Um, and Does that hurt your community? In the long run, any, uh, 
Sorry, not the long run or the short run. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, when, when we're trying to get progress for the people that have put us in our seats, we're often the first person called because we're seen at the co-op, we're seen at the grocery store, we're seen at the gas station, and we're the ones that are constantly being like, hey, what are we doing to help address homelessness in our area? And when we talk about the, the jurisdictional boundaries between municipal, provincial, and federal governments, you know, we, one of the things that we typically hear, especially in northern Saskatchewan, and, and to a certain effect, and even in urban centers, you know, I talked to some councillors from Saskatoon who have shared the same sentiment, that if we're talking about um, homelessness, uh, that you know, it's not a municipal job outside of zoning the area that uh, we would like a homeless shelter in, and potentially putting in some, some capital dollars or operations dollars, if that's what the council of the day believes is their role in doing so to help in that partnership. Um, the, my belief is that it's a provincial issue. Um, because the provincial, when you look at the, the factors that lead to homelessness, you're, you're going to have, um, whether it be the Ministry of Social Services, um, the Ministry of Health, the Corrections, um, that, that's typically the, the ministries that have to deal with it if they don't deal with it. So to me, it's a provincial issue. And when we've, when we've brought those issues forward and we get the, the assistant to the, to the minister and whatnot, I believe the reason why so many people don't see the systems working for themselves is because they don't follow and I don't want to toot my own horn, but when someone calls me and they ask me about an issue, um, I, if it's something that the, involves the municipality and something that the municipal politicians such as myself have, have enacted or changed, I will typically allow that operations team, our CAO or, or the manager of those departments, to reach out to them. But this, the, the, the key second piece is that I reach back out to them. Because yeah. they called me, I got them in touch with the person that could best answer that question, and then I follow up to make sure, did that satisfy your answer? And if it didn't, what can we do by policy to help that? And if, and, if, and if I disagree with that policy change, then it's my job to explain to them the reasons why, because that's the accountability piece that I have with the people that put me in the seats that I'm in. How much does respect come into play in a role like yours? Uh, respect for the administration, respect for the voter, yeah. to tell them the truth, to be open and honest that sometimes you can't fix everything. Sometimes right. you have a limited budget, which we all understand, and you're unable to fix every single issue in the world that people may have. Yeah. So how much respect do you have to give yourself to say to people, I'm sorry, we've gone as far as we can go on this issue, whether it be homeless, until the federal government or provincial government sits at the table with us, we're basically spinning our wheels. And, and letting people know that you're spitting your wheels, but you're still trying. Yeah. I think, I think most people will give you the opportunity to continually serve them if they know you're still trying. Yeah. Um, I often say that if any politician believes that they're, they've, they've solved all the issues and that they're all done, they will be done. Uh, it'll just be the next election that they'll find that out. Um, and, and for me, when you go back to that, the, the core question that you had there about respect, I believe respect and trust, whether it be in a relationship uh, with, your, with your wife or partner or your kids or whatever, the, if you don't have respect and trust, you lose a lot of, of groundwork that you, that you need as, a, as an elected leader, as a partner in, in your relationship. Respect and trust is the number one thing that you have to keep. And, and when you say that there's that, that necessity to, to tell the truth, um, there's, there's so many complicating factors within the municipal systems and the policies that, that you have, like for example, an in-camera session. If someone asks you um, something that was discussed in camera, right? And there's certain things and provisions that only certain things can be discussed in camera, you know. Um, legal legal label, leg, labor and land. Right, <laughs> right. So if, it, if it's involving something <laughs> like that, or if they've heard that uh, a municipal em uh, employee is, is, has left the organization, they want to have questions as to why, those are HR related matters, yeah. and, and, and the, those people have their, their rights to be protected as well. So when you tell somebody, like, I'm not really at liberty to discuss that, they need, they, I think there's a second key component yeah. of that as well, to, t to tell them why you can't discuss that and say it's an in-camera discussion or that's an HR related matter and we can't discuss HR related matters. So I believe having that, that second piece of the explanation. When someone reaches out to you, help them understand why you're doing what you're doing, not just what you did. I have two last questions for you because I know you're a busy man and you want to probably get away and get ready for tonight's gala. I want to ask this important question. You've been in municipal governments for some time now, not a long time, but for some time. There's a lot of newly elected municipal leaders from across Canada right now, whether they be in BC or PEI or Newfoundland, Labrador. 
what advice would you give that first term counselor, that first year counselor that you wish you would have known when you first got elected to make the transition from private citizen to public service? Uh, keep the fire in your belly stoked for as long as you can. But the key thing is to learn to where you need to direct it and take six months, go through the motions, um, speak up where you feel you have to. Sometimes you're gonna have to drink from the fire hose. There's going to be a lot of places where you're, there's a steep learning curve. You're not knowing what's coming next. Uh, take the time, be patient with yourself. Keep that fire stoked. Once you've learned where to direct it, open your mouth and let the fire flow. Uh, you're, you're gonna know where, it's gonna, where, where you're best suited um, to, to have that directive. And for me, uh, from a governance standpoint, the only thing I can say is keep your nose in the operations but your fingers out. Um, I find so many people get themselves involved in whether or not the end gate is on the grader because you had a resident reach out to you and say they left a, a line in front of their driveway. Their windrow is their the windrow. <laughs> it, it, or what are you doing about the potholes and you think it's your job to call the operations manager and say, hey, I need you to go fill those potholes. That's not your job. Your job is to create systems where the potholes can be filled. And that means you have the human resources and the, and the actual resources to fill that pothole. And you do that through financial planning and through strategic planning with your municipality. Um, so, like I said, keep that fire stoked, do what you can to serve your community in the best ways that you can, but learn where to direct that fire. So the last question for you, and it's the million dollar question, it's about the, the uh, La Orange, the city, town. Town. Town of La Orange. What makes it such a unique place to live, work, and raise a family? Uh, I work. I work as a uh, as a technician for a telecommunications company in, in northern Saskatchewan, and uh, one of my coworkers has said this. Uh, his name is Barry. We call him the Bro, uh, and uh, he said it to me one time, and I laughed for about five minutes straight. And uh, one of the things that is the greatest part about Larange and, and the northern areas is that we have lakes, rivers, and mosquitoes the size of helicopters. Um, <laughs> It's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, LaRange is one of those places where you get off the beaten path. Uh, a, a couple, about an hour and 15 uh, north of us is a community of Waska Sioux, a national park, Prince Albert National Park. Everyone knows Waska Sioux. I say get off the beaten path, go a little bit further. We have beautiful trails to go out and, and really immerse yourself in nature, not just the, the wooden boardwalk through the, through the trees. Get your toes in the mud, uh, enjoy the lake, enjoy the river. We've got so many great people in the north that if you show up with nothing but love in your heart, you're going to be shown nothing but love when you're there. Um, it's something that can really get inside of your, your skin, heart, and bones and become something that you want to live, work, and play in. So come up to LaRange, take a look around, you'll, you'll fall in love with the lake. I suggest, uh, you know, don't do the fall or spring because that's typically when the, the lake is freezing up or, uh, or uh, breaking up. And in those cases, you can't really do all the amenities of going out and seeing everything there, but there's always something going on. Well, I've said to everyone who's come on the show, if you come on the show, I come up to your community to spend my economic dollars. So I will see you this summer Sounds in Larange. Good. Thank you so much for this. No problem. Can't wait to see you up there. We'll take you out in the boat. For sure. Thank you so much to our guests for joining us for this episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in and being part of this conversation. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of our latest interviews and special episodes. We have some amazing guests lined up and we can't wait to share their stories with you. If you're able to, please consider backing the show to help us to continue to grow and produce more high quality content. Every little bit helps. We appreciate your support as well. A link to our Patreon account is in the show notes. And if you can, please don't forget to subscribe to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for more behind the scenes content, show updates, and so much more. And finally, as much as we all love our phones and technology, let's remember to put them down and have real life in-person conversations with the people in our lives, even if it's just for five minutes. Thank you again for watching, and we'll see you next time on the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, everyone, just keep talking.